Now, the, I think the youngest, certainly one of the youngest elected officials in Britain, as well as one of the livest wires you're going to find in British politics, Parliament would be infinitely richer for his presence if he can get there. But he's an independent, you see. And that makes his election as an independent councillor in the London borough of Kingston even more commendable. But he's also a commentator and a keen observer of British politics. And I wanted to talk to James Giles about the Boris Johnson affair. And I'm glad to say he joins me now. James, thank you uh, for uh, coming back on to the mother of all talk shows. Uh, you may have a different point of view, but tell me if you do. I found it an unedifying sight. Uh, the, I've been in these kangaroo courts before. Uh, when your political enemies are pretending to be a quasi-judicial uh, jury <laughs> to judge your uh, conduct, it, it never comes out all that nicely. What did you think of it? No, these committees never do, do they? I mean, we've had some particularly odd days in British politics since 2016. But today, from Boris Johnson's I'm innocent, uh, nothing to do with me, Gov, to Rishi Sunak's tax returns, to Steve Baker uh, describing Boris Johnson as a pound shop Nigel Farage, um, you know, there are days uh, that really do uh, produce the outcome of decades, as you said at the start of your show, and uh, this had to be one of them. Uh, we had a core of, you're quite right to say, I think, Boris Johnson's political enemies, uh, you know, probing him about his affairs. Boris Johnson, of course, being one of the great survivors in modern British politics. He seems to be uh, the man that can just come back and bounce back at any minute. And even today in The Guardian, there was speculation over whether he could return in the future as a potential leader of the opposition in the Conservatives. Now, after today, I'm not sure uh, that that is an all likely uh, circumstance or, or scenario, rather. Boris Johnson saying, among, among other things, he felt that the lawful parties, as he described them, became unlawful after he left the events, which is why it wasn't obvious to him that the rules and guidance were broken. It emerged that he didn't take any advice from government lawyers, just his two media advisors, uh, Jack Doyle and uh, James Slack, uh, felt that socially undistanced farewell drinks uh, were within the guidance and that holding these events were, to quote him, essential uh, to the functioning of government. Now, all of these things in his defence are really quite so significant when we look at the purview of the committee. Uh, Boris Johnson has admitted already that he did mislead Parliament. But what the committee is looking at is whether he knowingly misled Parliament or whether he recklessly uh, misled Parliament. And one can argue the questions were framed in such a way to suggest the committee was minded at the very least uh, to suggest that he recklessly uh, misled Parliament. I don't think uh, his stance today his approach to the committee did him any favors at all uh almost i think all but certain now that the committee will decide that he at the very least recklessly misled mps by repeating and relying on assurances uh that the guidance hadn't been broken um and the thing will be i think in johnson's defense whether anything he said today will do enough to persuade the MPs who ultimately decide what sanction he faces, uh, if any, uh, whether the contributions he made will have any difference in maybe trying to minimise uh, any penalty that may be forthcoming. Well, reckless could be said to be Boris Johnson's middle name. His entire life has been reckless, a reckless trail of domestic and financial and even political uh, uh, disgrace left behind them. And yet, and yet, if you ask me, facing a wipeout, which they seem to be facing, with the utterly anonymous, dwarfish, uh, 
Rishi Sunak, an illegitimate premier, never been elected, no vote was cast in his favor, not even from conservative members, because he had no opponent in the end, so entirely untested and entirely ineffective, it seems to me, in reversing the Conservative Party's collapse in the country, in the opinion polls. If you ask me, is there a single Conservative who can at least mitigate the electoral disaster they are facing, I'd have to say yes, it would be Boris Johnson because, and perhaps because of his persona, he is able to reach voters that other Conservatives can't reach. Do you agree? Uh, yes, he can. He is, uh, uh, whether you love him or hate him, he is a remarkable politician in that he is even more Teflon, perhaps, than Tony Blair. Um, there are vast swathes of people in working-class constituencies who, prior to the 2019 general election, when Boris led the Conservatives to that landslide majority, had never voted Conservative in their life and ordinarily would never dream of doing so. And those people, a good chunk of them, would still vote for him again tomorrow. We had Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak uh, serving as Prime Minister in 2022. And when YouGov did a poll of who the best Prime Minister had been in 2022, the answer was overwhelmingly Boris Johnson, followed by don't know slash none of the above. Uh, Rishi Sunak isn't cutting through and that's why we're seeing Labour leads in, Labour leads in the polls of, in many cases, over 20%. Uh, he isn't cutting through, and why would he? You know, the man today, talk about burying bad news, chose the middle of Boris's hearing to release his tax uh, returns, which showed that in 2019 to 2020, he paid over 200 million in tax. In 2020, 21, he paid over 300 million in tax. And in the last tax year, he paid over £430 million in tax. This man is not relatable to the working classes. He is not relatable to the people that he needs if he wants to build a winning coalition come the next general election. Now, my prediction is, given that he simply cannot cut through to those people, is that he will cling on to power for dear life, and we probably won't be going to the polls in this country until January of 2025. Now, lastly, James, uh, what can this committee do to Boris Johnson? What's, the, what's the, the range of penalties they can impose? Uh, and does the House of Commons itself have to endorse their findings? Well, look, it's important to say that Boris Johnson's already admitted to misleading the House, which is in itself a breach of the ministerial code. But of course, he is no longer a minister, and that falls outside of the remit of the committee that is investigating him. What the committee is looking at is whether he either recklessly or knowingly uh, misled Parliament. Now, the case that Johnson uh, willfully or recklessly misled MPs uh, looks to be that he saw some of the events with his own eyes. He admitted that today, uh, that he ignored social distancing. Again, he, he partially admitted that today uh, and relied on assurances from his media advisors, his spin doctors, as opposed to any government lawyers uh, to confirm that no rules had been broken. And so I think most reasonable people could draw the conclusion that there may have been some recklessness there but that again as you say is boris johnson so the committee can recommend a suspension from the house uh, and if that suspension is for more than 10 working days or two weeks then a recall petition could be triggered which would force a by-election in boris johnson's constituency now that isn't up to the standards committee the standards committee will recommend a penalty uh, if they find Boris Johnson guilty of uh, recklessly or knowingly misleading the House. 
and it'll be up to the MPs in the House of Commons to vote uh, whether to approve that sanction, propose a different sanction, or to let him off scot-free with no uh, punishment at all. Now, the issue I think that we'll find when the committee does report back, my own view, they will find him guilty of at least recklessly misleading the House. But it's whether the defence that Boris has submitted, be it his written defence or be it his oral testimony today to the committee, has done anything to persuade MPs to minimise the sanctions against him and most crucially, minimise those sanctions to beneath 10 working days to stop the risk of a by-election taking place, which he almost certainly would lose. James Giles, as always, thank you for your wisdom in One So Young. A great, Pleasure. great tour of the House of Commons proceedings uh, today.